Lord, Lord, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. We thank you, Lord, that you are with us today. We thank you for your glory, Lord God, being revealed in us, Lord God. Anoint this time. We ask you, Holy Spirit, just to come. Come and move through our lives. Touch us. Heal us. Deliver us. Set us free. Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. God's good. A couple uh, quick announcements. Those of you that uh, know or don't know, this coming Friday we're doing a uh, video. We're live streaming Whose Children Are They? And uh, that will be 7 o'clock this Friday. We're doing it uh, Friday. Calvary Chapel's doing it on Sunday. Or Saturday. What did I say? Sunday? Saturday. It's an S, so. <laughs> Saturday. From 7 to 9. Uh, there is a cost, $11 uh, for adults, for youth, it's $9. I wouldn't probably bring kids, little kids to it. Uh, for tickets, there's uh, Whose Children Are They? There's a website to that. And uh, I did post it on our church Facebook page. It's under an event. And if you go to that event and you go down, it says ticket, and you click to that, and it takes it to the tickets for this this one here so um, so there's that and also we're sad but we're excited for our brother Brock he's he's leaving this moving to Seattle to be with his son and uh, he had uh, part of his church his library he had he put it in the table so you guys can go through it after service and if there's anything there you would like and uh uh, we're, at the end of the service, we're going to pray for pray for Brock, and we're going to send him out. And uh, we just appreciate the time that we have with him, but it's important he be with his his son over in the Seattle area. So, Hallelujah, God's good, God's on the move. What my whistle here, real quick. Hallelujah, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about hitting the mark. Jesus hit the mark. We celebrated last week. He rose from the dead. He hit the mark. Now he's at work in us. And we're going to hit the mark. And that's what we're going to talk about today. To hit the mark in life, we must move from being spectators to participants. This is a participating sport that we participate in the kingdom of God. And... I, you know, I, I've talked about our younger years going to church. Basically, we were participants. We were CEO Christians, Christmas and Easter only. And we would go do our religious thing on those ho three holidays. And then the rest of the time, we did our own thing. Once in a while, my mom could drag us out to go to church. But we were spectators. But then I found the Holy Spirit, and I found out I could be a participant. And the whole thing changed. And it's exciting to be a participant in the kingdom of God. And so that's what we're going to talk about. What Jesus purchased for us, and we celebrated last week, that his resurrection, he purchased for us that we can be participants in the kingdom. <clears throat> so we want to uh, move from being a spectator of the game to being a participant. I, uh, I was never able to go into college and... and college ball and that kind of stuff, but when I was in high school, I loved being out on the field and participating in the sport. And uh, it's just a different atmosphere when you're around the rest of the guys and you're, you're uh, rooting for each other and it's, you, one succeeds, we all succeed. One fail, we all fail. So you're working together for accomplishment of the team. The ki our team is the kingdom of God the body of Christ, and so as we are participating, each one of us, and it's just a sad thing that's happened in a lot of church mentality is we hire the pastor to do that, and you're missing out on the game. You know, it's, yeah, that you, there's, there's a scripture that says certain situations call for you, other know, in church to lay hand in the sick, and, and that, that's, that's very legitimate. But you do it too. 
you have the same spirit inside of you as I have inside of me. And so as we, as we engage and realize that, yes, I can be a participant in this and, uh, and let God move. A spectator never feels the pain and the sacrifice needed to be victorious. In, com- uh, in turn, they will never feel the full reward of the victory. When you're out on the field and you're fighting, you know the hardest yardage on the field is the one-yard line. And that's when I love being a center linebacker. I got a split lip right here. We didn't have the full bars, all that. My, my face mask and his, the running back face mask hit right at the line of scrimmage and they interlocked. And it, it kind of knocked me Lulu, split my lip. I had to get stitches in my lip. They pulled me out of the game because I wasn't very stable after that. But uh, that's probably what led to eventually the rupturing the disc in my neck that I had to have a disc uh, removed because I love plowing in there. And I didn't have speed, but I had power right at the line of scrimmage. So, hallelujah. Let me get off a little story. God wants to release the Holy Spirit's power in the world. What does He need for this to happen? One, first... He needs us to get into the game. We got to get out there and get in it. We are offensive instruments in the hands of the Lord to push back darkness, to take dominion, and not let the devil win. And three, we must be able to hit the mark. We have to hit the mark. See that? My. Back that first picture up there was the hitting the mark. That's what we're talking about, hitting the mark. And we have to hit the mark. And God is equipping us to hit the mark. And that's what we're going to talk about. We are arrows in God's quiver to be shot into the world to hit the mark that God intends. As we listen to the Holy Spirit, as we listen and we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, we will hit the mark. And we will bring forth God's glory in the earth. We must be offensive. We, uh, last night, was a <clears throat> went to uh, the Republican Party uh, Lincoln Day dinner for Benton County. Two weeks ago, we, we were at the Franklin County one. And they've asked me to open prayer for both of them. I'm really privileged to do that. And, uh, but it's, you know, if we're going to win elections, we've got to engage. The problem has been is is conservatives have been passive. You leave me alone, I'll leave you alone, I'll live my life, you live your life. You know, and, but all of a sudden now, they're wanting to invade into my life what I can believe, what I don't believe, and all those things is stuff. And so it's, it's because we haven't engaged. The opposition is totally engaged, but we're not engaged. But now it's time we've got to, politically we have to engage, as well as spiritually we have to engage. Because it's not a physical war, it's a spiritual war that we're battling. To change the culture. What culture do we want? That's the question. What culture do we want? Do we want socialism? Do we want communism? Or do we want what our founders gave us? So we have to engage. We have to engage. We're arrows in God's quiver to be shot into to what He's intended. Some people are being called to run into run for politics. Praise the Lord. We're all behind you. You know, if, you, if you're called to do that, we need godly men and women running for political offices. How do you change the culture? Get engaged. The body of Christ get engaged in the culture. What happens is we pulled away, we let the, the school boards and all that kind of run our schools and stuff. What's happened to our schools? They've been infiltrated by liberalism, communism, all of this weird stuff that's being indoctrinated into little kids. Five-year-olds talking about things I won't even mention. 
We must be offensive. We are arrows in the hand of God, shot into the world to do His will. If the church doesn't engage in the culture, we can't blame anybody but ourselves because we have not engaged. Isaiah 49.2 And He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of His hand He has hidden me and made me a polished shaft. In His quiver He has hid me. John 20.21 Then said Jesus to them, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Psalms 127, 4 and 5. As, an arrow, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them, that they shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with their enemies at the gates. So we're going to talk about some arrows here this morning. That we're shot. That God has a quiver full of arrows, but we have to be taken out of the quiver and shot. Is it we have any archers here? All right. Boy, I got a clean house here now. I used to be an archer. Back when I was in high school, I, I had an archery competition. Uh, we did all kinds of competition. And I went to Northwest Regional. It was over in Everett, I think it was. I come in fourth. And out of five. No. <laughs> no, I don't know how many were there, but I come in fourth. And uh, we hunt, uh, it's hunt, uh, hunt archery, all that stuff. So the Lord gave me this about, this, this, about he talks about his quivers full of arrows and stuff. Because of my background in archery, Lord, help me put this, this together this, out a long time ago. So there's four main parts to an arrow. The shaft. The shaft is the character, the strength, the integrity, the foundation. If you don't have a good shaft, it's dangerous. You don't undersize your arrows. Your, your arrows have to be matched to your bow. Back when I was, they were just coming out with compounds. I had all these, whoo, these, these, these weird compound bows and stuff. But uh, if you had a, a 60 pound draw, that would be at maximum draw, it would be 60 pounds. So you had to have a shaft that could handle that 60 pounds because when you release it, poo, that bow arrow will actually bend and then, and then it'll finally straighten out. And so you had to have it matched to your bow. Uh, for competition, we, had, we shot arrows without feathers on them because we wanted them to match the bow and the most precise arrows that would fly. And uh, then we would put the, the veins on it, the feathers, and that would be a final stabilizer. And so it was, it's, quite, it's quite an art, but your shafts are, are very critical. The transmission of the energy from the bow goes into that shaft that it can fly and hit the target. You don't want it undersized. I've had seen people that use an underside sh shaft, and when they release it, it snaps and it goes right, right into their hand. And so you had to be very careful that you had the right shaft. So your shaft is the char your character, your strength, your integrity, and the foundation. Second, feathers stabilizers that final stabilizer that help you get to the target the knock the knock is what the arrow goes onto the string it locks it onto the string so it transmits the power from the bow when you release it to the energy of the shaft that sends the shaft out if you have a if you're shooting a tight cluster you might hit one of your knocks and it might have a crack in it so you inspect it and make sure that knock because when you released it uh, it wouldn't be good if it had a broken knock. So knock is direction, transference of energy, and tip. And the tip, the, uh, so the tip is the power to penetrate and break through. 
So quickly, looking at the shaft. The shaft is the strength of your character and integrity will determine the amount of responsibility that God can entrust you with. You, as an arrow in God's quiver, the strength of your character and integrity will determine the amount of responsibility the Lord can trust you with. Now, there's people that have moved into ministry and they didn't have the character and integrity. And what happens, they falter. If they didn't have the integrity, I have no pastors that uh, money got them. Three G's that I learned, the gold, glory, and the girls will be the downfall to ministry, if you're a guy. Well, in our culture, it might not matter if you're a guy or a gal, <laughs> which is sad. The gold, the glory, the girls will attack your integrity. So what, <clears throat> what is character? First is the traits that define or describe a person. When you meet somebody and you get to know them, what are you judging? Their character. How they interact. Do, when you're talking, if you're a talk to somebody and they're just, they never look you in the eye. They're, they're doing this. My dad says when you're talking to somebody, you look them right in the eye. And when you give somebody a handshake, you give them a handshake, not a limp wrist. Oh, nice to meet you. Because those things are judged. Judging, people are judging who you are, your character, uh, and your integrity by, by simple things like that. So the traits that define or describe a person to uh, what you are to others than, <clears throat> other than biological factors. We can see a person's stature, all that kind of stuff. But if you would, uh, if we go back and we look at Saul, who God said that the children of Israel, they want a king. Okay? Samuel, give him Saul. So Saul, he says he's head and shoulders above everybody else. So you think, wow, he's a big stature guy. But he said, when Samuel approached him, he said, my, house, my father's house is the least in Israel, and I'm the least in my father's house. And he saw himself as inferior. Even though he was a big guy, he was very inferior. So what happened? He didn't succeed because he saw himself as a failure. So what happened as the leader, what happened to the army before Goliath? They were paralyzed in fear because Saul did not see himself as a conqueror. So does it mean physical stature mean anything? Or this ruddy little kid that comes out there, 16, 17, 18 years old, comes out there and says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine against the armies of the Most High God? So it's not physical care. So when you see somebody, we're judging who they really are. Number three, the conduct that makes, makes up your reputation. What's a person's reputation? Are they a trust, trustworthy person? Are they a person that, that you can count on that will be there when you need them? Number four, the code of conduct that rules most actions. What's, what how, how do they function? So it's, it's like, uh, we don't have this kind of problem out here, but Dr. Lynn Lucas, who uh, is uh, in Long Island, New York, you don't do anything there that you're not dealing with uh, one of the mobs. The Irish, the Catholic, the, the Asian, all these mobs. And said, so she, she, you'll be meet, in a, a meeting, you'll be speaking in a meeting, and afterwards... Somebody will come up and slip money in your hand. She says, never accept money. 
because it always comes with strings. She immediately takes it, says, I'm going to give this to the pastor and let him decide what to do with it. That, I believe, has been one of the most downfalls of political people and also people in the church. What's your price? I can't be sold. We can't be sold. That should be a part of our integrity and character. I don't have a price. Everything comes into the, the church. It's, I don't set my salary. The elders set my salary. And God blesses us. And, and, uh, and so it's, a, it's a part of integrity and character that you're not, you don't, can't be sold. That's part of it. And the, the next one is the, the discipline. The def, what's our default? What do we fall back to? When we're in a crisis, when we're, when we're in a situation, what's our fallback point? In Job 1.8, And the Lord said to Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one who fears God and eschews evil? Even his wife said, Job Die. You got all these boils. You got all these things happening. His, people, his guys turned against him. Everybody turned against him. Just, just blaspheme God and die. But he wouldn't do it because his character says, I'm not going to do it. That's a whole other story. You could read that. If you do not develop godly character, you will not find your true purpose and destiny in God. So that's the one thing that God is working in all of our lives, and it's a continual process, is developing our character. Developing us so that He can trust us to move us to the next position, or the next place, or where He wants us, or what He wants us to do. And that, that God can trust us, that when He puts us in a situation... He puts us there to succeed, not to fail. He wants to promote us. But who can limit that? Me. Me, I can limit that. The godly character of a person determines their integrity. Then how much of a load or pressure that they can handle over time then how soon they can be put to use and at what level of responsibility. When Shirley and I were in Yakima, God called us to go to Yakima, to pioneer a little church up there. We had 25, 30 people through the uh, seven years that we, we pastored up there. And I met with other pastors once once a week and uh, for coffee. I didn't drink coffee, so he said, uh, pastors that drink. I had a Pepsi. <laughs> but uh, it was a good time of fellowship. So one of the, the pastors said, let's go to breakfast or something. So I met, met him for breakfast, and, and we were talking and stuff, and he said, I have a question for you. And his church was probably about 400, something like that. And he said, how come I, when I see you, you're always happy? I said, well, yeah, I'm happy. You know, what's, what's to be discouraged about? He said, if I had a church your size, I'd quit. In some denominations, if you have a church 25 or under, they shut you down. But no, denomination didn't set me there. God set me there. And if you read what happened with Moses, he said, God set up judges, some over 10, some over 50, some over 100, some over 1,000. I would much rather be over 10 than 1,000. But it's 10, your ego can't be involved in it. He's got, he's got 1,000, I only got 10. What is it? God, why do you put me over here in the backside of the desert with ten people? Is that what your heart and character should say? Or should, what my heart was, 
And what I told him, I said, if God gives me 10 people, those are going to be the best 10 people. I'm going to pour everything I have into those 10 people. It's not about the numbers. But see, that's what being faithful to what God called us to up there when God called us back here in 2008 to build here. For a long time, we were 25. 30 people come, go. Now we've, sometimes we have 80s, we had 85, we had 100. You know, it, it, it's, it's not numbers. If we're always looking to things to judge our character, we're going to falter. Do what God has called you to do it and do it the best you can do it and leave the consequences to God. Don't base your ego and your pride and all these things on numbers and statistics and all these things. Just flush that stuff. If God gives you a, a, a buddy or, 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 or someone to, to share, pour your life into them. That, that person might be the next Billy Graham or Oral Roberts, but God's called you to, to nurture that person. It's not numbers. It's not statistics. All it's, it's, it's character is from the heart. It's, it's giving of yourself is, is here. Godly character is integrity, purity, honesty, humility, unselfishness, unselfish giving, uh, serving, giving, moral uprightness, and obedience. That's what godly character is. Where our character is revealed, is revealed in, in an area of the spiritual, marital, relational, parental, professional, financial, personal, physical, national, social. All of everything we engage our life in is a judgment of our character. What do we bring to the table? If God was to call me to, pol to politics. Pray God He doesn't. I would do it the best that I could for the glory of God. And I would leave, this is from politicians told me, the number one thing that politicians are concerned about is being reelected across the board. It's not about doing the job they're called to do. You should leave your reelection to God, and you do what you're called to do for the people, the people that you represent, and you can't be bought. That's the problem with politics today: is people are bought and paid for. And they talk one way, but they do something totally opposite. Their character is in the toilet, as far as I'm concerned. Don't trust them. The power of God's love, grace, flowing in our lives will develop godly character in us so God or His power can flow three, freely through us. God wants men and women of integrity and character that He can flow through them that they won't receive it. Look at me. I'm God's gift to mankind. Nope. Flesh. <laughs> You're no gift to mankind. I'm no gift to mankind. Jesus was gift to mankind. And we're to point Him to the cross. It's the cross. He paid the price. I'm just His servant. The lack of godly character will be a person's downfall. The enemy is looking for our weak spots to exploit our shaft. So that under pressure, we will snap and compromise. Feathers. 
Stability, security, the Word of God. The feather brings stability to, to the arrow. So it can fly true and straight. Psalms 119.11 Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. You have to get the word in your heart. 119.105 Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. If it's not in the word, don't do it. The knock. Where the arrow attaches to the string. Balance, direction, the church. The knock locks on to the string and transmits the energy from the bow to the arrow. We must be locked into the church. The church, the body of Christ. Do you love the church with all of its shortcomings? Yes. Because we're all made up of sinners. And if any of us are perfect, I want to meet you. If you think you're perfect, you're not. We have to lock into the body of Christ. And it's, it breaks my heart when I hear people that have disengaged in ch- from church because they've been hurt or wounded, disappointed, because people failed. And I don't want to just pop your bubble, but we will all fail at some time. I will fail at some time. We will all fail. We'll get under pressure. We'll be doing things, and we'll speak out something. And so, oh, why did I say that? Ask my wife. We're not perfect. And if you find a perfect church, it won't be perfect anymore that you're there. (laughs) We must be locked into the church. Do you love the church with all of its shortcomings? The church is Christ's bride. Be careful how you speak about her. Matthew 16, 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, the rock that he just said, you are the Christ, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Jesus is building his church. We're all in construction mode. We're not there yet. When we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air, or we leave this body and go to heaven, then then we're walking in perfection. This, this life has passed away. But until then, we're all a work in progress. We must be locked into the church where God has planted you. God plants us. I was in a church in Alaska, in Kenai. I was a, helped start a church in Oregon. I came back to Tri-City Christian Center. I joined Pastor Roy here, and we went to Yakima, and I'm back here. That's the churches that I've been involved with my whole life. And every one of them have not been perfect, and every one of them have made mistakes, and I've learned a lot being there and being in leadership and sitting under training and all that stuff. And I know things to do and things not to do. And I've said this before, I am so glad that I've walked with the Lord 50 years with the Holy Spirit to be where I am today, doing what I'm doing today in the time that we're doing it with all hell breaking loose and all that stuff. I'm glad I got that history behind me that I know what is good and what is bad to help lead us through this time, to be encouraged, to be uplifted, to help us grow and mature into what God is doing in this hour. Not what happened 30, 40, 50 years ago, but what God is doing now. Did I read Hebrews 10? And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. That's why we're together in the body of Christ, to stir each other up. 
not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as in the matter of some, but exhort one another and so much more as we see the day approaching. The day is approaching. Six months or so ago, the Lord gave me a message that I shared. When Noah entered the ark, God put the animals in, his family went on board, and the door of the ark was open for seven days. Many theologians believe it was seven days is the time of mourning that Methuselah, his grandfather, helped him build the ark. Methuselah passed. Seven, year, seven days of mourning. The door of the ark was open. Seven days of grace. Anybody on the earth could have went in, but not one went in besides Noah and his family. Who shut the ark? God. The door of the ark is open right now. But I tell you shortly, the door is going to go shut. And God will shut the door. And it will be too late. The church is where we learn to move out with our anointing. In the church, we find our spiritual lineage and heritage. Many in the church today cannot describe their spiritual lineage or heritage because they have never stayed under authority to godly fathers long enough to receive it. And some of that is, uh, is there's a lot of things involved with, with that. But the longer we can stay under good spiritual fathers and teachers is very important to us. Family dynamics, things happen, cause jobs and different things for people to move and all that kind of stuff. So I don't want to condemn anybody that's not been able to do that. But when you find a place where God plants you, lock into it. Whether it's here or somewhere else. Like the centurion knew that his authority came from being under authority. We've talked about in the past, that, that about the centurion. How important is that my authority, your authority, comes from being under authority. That he can flow through us. Psalms 92, 12-13, The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow as a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of our God. The tip, the sharp, piercing, penetrating is the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. I would not want to be in ministry. I would not want to be involved in any kind of ministry if I did not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because that's the power. It's not me. It's the Holy Spirit. And when we speak as Spirit-filled believers, the Holy Spirit goes forward and pushes back darkness. 1 Thessalonians 1.5 For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. 1 Corinthians 2, 4-5 through And my speech and my preaching were not a persuasive words of human wisdom. I pray that I never get do that. Of human wisdom. But of demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That your power, like I said, that you have the same Holy Spirit as I do. And the same Holy Spirit can flow through you. <coughs> like the young man that went to the jury trial, and as he was going in, he was a, jury, a juror, and he, there's hundred and some people in the room. He said, Lord, is there anyone you want me to talk to in here? And 
The Lord impressed him to talk to the guy over in the wheelchair. And so he went over and struck up a conversation with him. He said, well, can I pray for you? See if God will heal you? And the guy said, well, no, what if nothing does happen? And he says, well, what if something does happen? He said, okay. He prayed for him. And the guy got up and was healed. Started running around the room. He prayed for eight other people in that room that day. And they were healed. Didn't say he was a pastor, he was a young man who believed the Word. The power of God is in you. The arrows are weapons that are meant to be shot, not to stay in the quiver. God wants to shoot us into the culture, shoot us into our job, shoot us into our community. However He wants to use us, He wants to shoot us. That's why <clears throat> I'm a PCO, political precinct officer in Franklin County, because I live in Franklin County. Do I do that because they asked me to pray for opening prayer and that kind of stuff? No, I do it because I want to be a light in the political process. I want to be a light. And how do you do that unless you go to where the people that need it are. Tanya and her horse, her horse stuff that she does. She's out there with horse people. Don't invite me to do that. I'd probably get kicked in the head, but she's the person for it. Margie, she came to us over a year and a half ago or so, and she'd been going over to the Planned Parenthood praying, and she was, she was getting beat up pretty good by the enemy. And we gathered around her, and we prayed for her, and encouraged her, and the Holy Spirit come on her life, and she's changed, and she's still doing it. She's fighting for little ones. Opportunities of praying for people. Every one of us have opportunities that God wants to shoot us into the culture where we are. Shoot us into it. Wherever arrows in his quiver. Say, Lord, here, shoot me. Shoot me. The master archer will always use the best arrows with the truest flight. In competition, I had my primary arrows, my secondary arrows, and my third. If I broke one, I went, had to go to another one. You want to use your best. Lord, here am I, use me. I want to be your best. Not rating myself to anybody else, but I want to be better than I was yesterday. I want to be better tomorrow and next week than I was. That I'm constantly growing and maturing in what God has for me, for you. Romans 10, 14 through 15. How, how then shall we shall they call on Him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel, who bring glad tidings of good things. They say on average a person has to hear the gospel message 12 to 13 times. So there's a lot of witnessing that needs to go on. The gospel is not a pulpit ministry. It's a street ministry. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Christ's gift to us. Verse 11. 
And he himself gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's all of us. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure and stature and fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plottings. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into Him who is the head, Christ from whom the whole body joint knitted, knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. I don't see anywhere in Paul's exhortation here to the, the, the Ephesian church to where it's all based upon the pastor will do it. The prophets will do it. My job, it says description, this is my job description, is help all of us do it. All of us do it. One could put a thousand to flight. To flight, two can put how many? Ten thousand. So is it better that two of us come together, three, four, five, and we all engage? We all engage and say, "Here, my Lord, use me. Use me today. Use me tomorrow at my job." Wherever I am tomorrow, Lord, use me. Let your light shine through me. And that moment you touch somebody, and you might be the third, fourth, fifth, the twelfth person that talks to that person, and they'll say, and they begin to weep, and they'll say, I want to receive Jesus. You might be that moment the harvester. But a lot of the time you may be the planter, the sower, the nurturer. Bring into the place that someone, someone's life could be touched. There's a couple, they're not here today, but Testimonies of she's going to a doctor and she was witnessing to this this lady there and and uh, they're getting married and and said uh, have you gone through marriage counseling no we haven't and she said well, you need to go through marriage counseling and so uh, they contacted a, a church here and. Uh, started marriage counseling and hadn't been church for I don't know when decided to go to church they had an altar call got saved next time she goes in she says, yeah I accepted the Lord as my savior I told her great I didn't say oh bummer she's not going to our church no Praise God, the kingdom of God advanced by another soul. And where they're going to another church, that's great. That's great. We're not in competition. We're not in competition with each other. We're not in competition with other churches. We're not in competition. We're only competition we're against is the devil. And we're fighting for one soul at a time. Lord, give us one more. Let's pray. Then as we... Do some couple worship songs.
and then we'll have communion. Lord, we thank you, Lord, this morning. Lord, you are building an army. Lord, you are building your army, the body of Christ, Lord God, for the kingdom of God. Lord, that they would be, that we would be effective influence in our community. Lord, we would be effective influence in all that you call us to do. Lord, on our jobs, Lord, on our activities. Lord, if we're at our, our kids, our grandkids' soccer games or baseball games or whatever. Lord, when we're out in the public, Lord, I pray right now, Lord, I pray, open our eyes so we can see. Open our ears to hear who, who you want us to talk to. Who you want us to befriend. Lord, Lord, we want to be used by you. Lord, we want to advance the kingdom. Lord, one heart and one soul at a time. Lord, we pray that we can be an influencing fire in the community. Lord, that I love you, worship center, Lord, is, will be on fire. Fire with the kingdom of God. Lord, that, the, that we can have an influence, Lord, of expanding the kingdom, increasing the kingdom, wherever you call us to, whatever you call us to do, Lord Jesus. Lord, we want to be the arrows in your quiver that you pull out and you shoot us. Shoot us, Lord, and we will strike the target that you have before us, Lord, and we will accomplish what you send us to do. Lord Jesus, Lord, I rebuke the spirit of fear, Lord, off of your people, Lord. That, Lord, a spirit of intimidation, Lord, I speak the power of your Holy Spirit for boldness. Boldness. I pray for boldness in my heart. I pray for boldness in all of our hearts. That we would be bold and confident in what you have placed with inside of us, Lord God. The Holy Spirit inside of us. Lord, I pray your anointing to be upon each one of us. Lord, increase your kingdom in us. Increase your kingdom in this community. Increase, increase, increase. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this morning. We thank you, Lord, as we enter into a time of worship. Lord, to exalt you and lift you up. And then we will take communion, Lord Jesus. We just thank you. In Jesus' holy name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let's rise up. Let's, let's worship.